Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News or our monthly housing and economy update with our friend Martin North. How are you, Martin? Coming to us all the way from the UK. That's right. Yes, DFA HQ currently is in Bath in the UK, but uh, sell the same old, same old, still doing the same economic analysis and, uh, you know, YouTubes and everything else, but uh, just spending some time with family and friends and uh, visiting places in Europe I've not been for for years. So it's um, it's quite nice just to... Uh, have a bit of a change and I was here for the the, the coronation and we've got uh, cricket shortly and uh, Wimbledon and a few other things all teed up so uh, should be a fun few weeks. Sounds pretty good you definitely deserve a bit of a break Martin but um, as we said in the pre-interview I'm glad I've got good internet over there because we're literally on opposite sides of the planet and you look better than me I reckon with our internet so good stuff. Yeah well I've, I, I mean I'm on my portable system so I, you know there'll be some other stuff arriving a bit later but I, I basically brought with me what I could carry on the plane. So it's uh, one camera, one microphone, and um, a, a PC. But uh, thankfully, the internet connection is pretty good here. And um, so far, things have worked really well. Awesome. Any general thoughts? It's been uh, two months. We gave you a month to, to settle in. But on what's been happening around the world generally? Well, I think chaos. I mean, anybody who thinks that we are um, out of the worst and that, uh, you know, we're now into the sunny uplands of economic stability and political stability and, you know, uh, no, no, no. We, we are facing into a number of significant risks and we'll, we'll touch on some of those today. And, and what I find really interesting is that a lot of the analysts um, are, keep changing their tune. We've got lots of volatility in the markets. We've got lots of uncertainty, both politically and economically. And, um, you know, even even the budget that came through um, this week in Australia, you know, if you read between the lines, there are some really worrying cracks there about deficits into the future as well. So, yeah, we are in a very, very uncertain set of times. And look, anybody who thinks that they can call this and know precisely what's going to happen, I think they're kidding themselves and everybody else, frankly. Yeah, I often say to people, and you know, just look at places like Paris, France, where there's these ongoing crazy riots, and that it's it's kind of happening in slow motion, where people are starting to feel the pinch and waking up to everything that's been going on the last few years and whatever. So even if um, you know house prices go up or stocks go up a bit or whatever, it's very different to what's happening in, in the real world um, as they try and yep. paper over those cracks. Absolutely, and uh, you know, I, I always say to people. Um, repent at your leisure, you know, make sure that you understand what's going on. But sometimes doing nothing is better than doing something and then making the wrong decision and then regretting it later. I'm seeing that, for example, at the moment, a lot of people uh, in Australia are desperate to try and buy a property. And I'm saying, well, hang on a moment, you know, maybe that's not the, the, the smart strategy. So I'm not saying no, don't buy, but be cautious and careful and understand some of the risks that are going at the moment. Because, you know, look at banking there's banking crises um, developing around the world, you know, risk of recessions rising. Uh, I think stock markets are probably set for another um, fall ahead. And um, frankly, central banks continue to just show me that they don't know what they're doing. Absolutely. Let's dive into these fantastic slides of yours. So uh, Australia's residential um, property wealth comparative to other countries as a percentage of, of the wealth in, in a given nation or whatever is crazy high. Yeah, this is from CoreLogic's most recent uh, presentation. And it just, for me, it screamed a problem, right? We've got 10.9 million dwellings. We've got 56.1% of household wealth in housing. That's one of the highest in, in the world. And um, frankly, if you compare it with, you know, stocks and superannuation or commercial real estate, we are so over leveraged to property. And that really highlights for me one of the critical issues, which is that Clearly, the Reserve Bank and um, the Treasury are going to be very nervous about doing anything that might in any way dent the housing sector. Because if the housing sector took a dive, then the US will probably get by, but Australia wouldn't if the housing took a dive here. Because we are so leveraged, you know, our banks are so much into property, households are so much into property. So expect to continue to see more unnatural acts to try and support property. We saw those in the budget again. So, But that's, this is the reason. It's, it's too big to fail. Yeah, and I want people just to keep that um, total sales per annum figure in their head of 470000 as we move through these slides for, for, for later on as well. 
uh, yes. it's going to become important relative to some of these newer schemes and, and whatnot. Uh, but three months change. So we have seen a bit of a bounce, uh, mainly driven by um, Sydney and the capital cities. Yeah, so this is the, the latest. Now, of course, there's some lags and delays in the data. And uh, uh, I think people are probably reading into this probably too much. But it, it's mostly a Sydney thing. You know, Sydney was up um, 3% over the quarter. But again, you have to go granular because not all postcodes have the same um, movements. Uh, if I look at some of the regional areas in and around um, uh, New South Wales, they're still going backwards. But there were some areas in Sydney where there was a bit of a, a peak. In fact, first-time buyers, as we'll see in a second, you know, did come back a, li a little bit. But there are still significant pockets where prices continue to slide. And uh, with interest rates continuing to rise, of course, the RBA put the rate up again um, this last time around. Um, my expectation is that this is going to snuff out any um, significant recovery in property for the, for the next two or three years, uh, which is going to be a big deal. Uh, yeah, and retail sales are slow. So this is another example of kind of what's going on in, in the real economy rather than just what the punters are doing at the housing market level. Yeah, and this is important, right? Because, of course, what people are doing is spending less because they don't have the money that they had and they're, you know, rating savings or putting more on credit. But, yeah, retail sales volumes are down. And remember that inflation is still raging. So, you know, bearing in mind that this is not inflation corrected. So effectively, yes. in real terms, people are actually even worse. Um, in other words, they're spending a lot less. They're actually being picky about what they're spending, uh, spending more on food. Um, and obviously spending more on power, but uh, less discretionary stuff. They've also spent much less now on travel. So there was a spike in travel over Christmas and New Year. That's now dropped off as well. So that's really changed. Um, this is one of those leading indicators, um, looking backwards but pointing forwards, that suggests to me that uh, we are going to see more significant economic pain in the country because these rate rises are going to continue to bite. Yeah, absolutely, cost of living. So... Um Building approvals, as you mentioned before. Yeah, so that's another example. Building approvals continue to slide. And, of course, the HIA came out and said, oh, this is disaster. You know, this is we're not building enough property. Of course, the um, property and construction sector keeps saying, we need to build more property. We need to build more property because they want to feed the beast. Um, now we've got a migration um, number, something like 700,000 over two years, according to the Treasury. So we're going to see more people coming into the country feeding the beast. Remember what we said about property being the fundamental platform of you know, that's driving the economic um, prosperity of Australia. Well, you know, not surprising. But at the moment, less approvals are coming through. It takes perhaps a couple of years for approvals to come through to more construction. So the chances are that the supply of new property will continue to ease back. And that's going to have a significant impact on, um, you know, who can buy, what can buy. And um, the other point, of course, with those migrants, um, they've changed some of the parameters so that people can become permanent residents more quickly, and that means they can buy property and all those things. So everything is geared to try to actually protect the property sector. Yeah, that was the point I was going to get to as well, as we saw that 470 a thousand sales per annum figure if we've got migration that's on target for 350 400 thousand new people coming into australia it's easier for them to buy a property we've just heard about that new scheme they want to do where you can now buy a house with a, a sibling or, or a friend so if we have all these new buyers and people coming online at a time when we see these um, dwelling approvals uh, falling and I kind of see the parallels to the smaller regional banks in terms of the smaller regional builders. And even if it's just the confidence of the guys I talk to that are traders going, yeah, it's harder. And we're hearing about these firms falling over. So they're going to need to ask for more money. Or if they take over a job that's um, half completed, they need to reassess it. And that costs more. So this is all inflationary. And so it's going to get harder to build houses, get houses, and the ones that do are going to be more expensive. So this could be a sort of scenario where things are really bad in the in the real economy and the average person, but there's just not no new houses to, to take all this immigration and this new wave of people that can finally get a bigger first home buy grant, going with two people. Remember we used to joke about it's going to take three or four people to have a mortgage and it's going to be a 50-year mortgage? Well, this is kind of the first step in that direction. Uh, well, all the levers they've pulled are all in the same direction. So high migration, um, you know, as you say, you can, you know, club clubbing with somebody else now to get get a mortgage. The banks, of course, are desperate to, to lend because um, we'll see in a second some of the lending statistics are pretty weak. And um, it goes back to what I said, and that's why I started with property, because people need to understand that of all the games in town, the property game is by far the most significant in terms of economics, politically speaking, 
and also the construction sector, of course, are huge lobbyists in terms of actually um, pushing politicians a particular way. But one of the interesting observations is the number of failures of constru- in the construction sector continue to rise. They, it's one of the worst sectors. The number of bankruptcies are continuing to rise. Mm. And we're also seeing that the cost of construction is still rising very fast. So as you say, there's a real problem when, in fact, to build something new is going to cost you know, maybe 20% more than it was a year ago, that's going to put more upward pressure in some areas. On the other hand, if you look at borrowing power, in other words, how many, how much people can borrow, that's dropped dramatically by about 30% compared with a year ago because of the higher interest rates. So you've got this really weird dichotomy between where the lending capacity is and where the building costs are, and that's going to put more significant pressure on both the construction sector and also on property. Absolutely. Moving forward. So uh, you've already mentioned lending a little bit there, Martin, but these some of these granular charts in terms of investors and whatnot are interesting. Yeah, so it was really interesting because everybody said, hey, uh, lending jumped up first time for months, right? We actually saw quite in, a slight increase. But if you look at it, the reason partly is that we've got massive amounts of external refinancing. Um, people are still trying to get cheaper mortgages and people are, you know, frankly, if you've not checked your mortgage rate in the last year or so, you're probably not on the cheapest you could get. Assuming you've got a reasonable loan to value ratio and a reasonable credit history, people are shopping around. And that's why the external refinancing is huge. There was a short little spike up in terms of first time buyers. Now, that's firstly because of some of these incentive programs that are coming in. And also, of course, last month, the RBA did stop lifting rates. And so some people were calling that as the bottom, you know, effectively things were going to go improve from this point. Probably Spruikers particularly, of course, were celebrating the um, the turn. Um, but we'll see. I suspect that the RBA lifting, you know, very recently will snuff that out. Confidence dropped again, according to Roy Morgan. And uh, certainly in my surveys, I'm seeing a lot of first-time buyers who now can't afford to get in. And, and, and many people are now saying, well, maybe I'll just wait and see how this is going to play out. So I expect these lending trends to remain weaker. But, of course, the spruikers were talking about what you wouldn't believe. Yes. Uh, so mortgage stress has um, stabilised a little bit as well. Yeah. So this is um, a, 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 a really because people have been able to refinance. And when you refinance, in some cases, people have been refinancing and extending the term of the mortgage. And that means that the monthly repayments are lower or they've refinanced to a lower rate. And that's given people a little more wriggle room. Plus, we have seen some slight increase in terms of wages growth for some people. And that's helped a little bit. But um, the problem I see is that with the inflationary pressures where they are and with the cost of power going to rise significantly. And I know that the budget will touch us on the budget shortly. The budget sort of offered some help, but not enough to make really a lot of difference in my view. So I expect to see the rental stress continue to rise. Mortgage stress came back a little bit, will probably rise further because we are still to see the full impact of all those um, rate rises that came through. And we've still got this massive switch from fixed rate loans to variable rate loans. And in fact, July is a peak month. Yes. So I expect uh, July, August time to see uh, mortgage stress um, uh, unfortunately, even higher. Remember, I define it in cash flow terms, money in, money out. It's not the same as defaults, but it is saying that there are more households under financial pressure. And in fact, NAG came out and said they think about 40% of their borrowers potentially are now trapped with the mortgage they've got because they can't refinance. So things are getting quite serious. I think one of the other things we've probably both spoken about on our channels over the years is how the government are going to start to pick up um, and foot more of these bills for different things um, and thinking that it's going to be temporary. And we've seen in different countries there's been fuel handouts or you know grocery handouts, um, and this, this chart really exemplifies it, doesn't it, the, uh, how much uh, rental stress has outpaced mortgage stress, and that was one of the big things that was targeted in the budget. But if you're going to hand out X amount of dollars one year and inflation continues to trend higher, you can't really take that away um, once you start giving it out to people. Well, that's right. And of course, the interesting debate now is whether in fact the budget was inflationary or deflationary. So will it actually um, ease inflation a little, but I think only a little bit. Um, A 15% increase in some of the rental support sounds like a big number. Uh, And of course, you know, ABS says rents were going up by four or five percent per annum, but in fact, new rents were 15 to 18 percent. So it's not going to touch the sides. Um, This won't be sufficient, in my view, to solve the inflationary problem. It might actually create more inflation. The rental sector has just fallen over 
Um, the number of listings are still very da much down and people are having to spend a lot more just to find summer housing. So housing affordability is a critical issue. I'm afraid the budget, I think, really didn't do enough to be able to really make a significant difference. But they can at least, you know, politically say, well, we did some things, I suppose. Yeah. All right. So any adjustment to these scenarios after the most recent rate hike? Well, just to highlight the fact that, of course, now the assumption is the best case would be that they don't actually raise rates anymore. 3.85% is it. CBA is saying they think that's it. But then CBA has consistently under forecast the forward rates from the RBA. Um, the RBA in their recent statement on monetary policy did say that they did expect potentially to have to lift rates higher, but they would be data driven, which is why some of this data is so important. Uh, my base case scenario is that they will have to raise at least once more to 4.15%. So that's a mortgage rate of 6.5 to 7.5. It's going to stay in that range for some time because the second thing is the markets have been predicting significant falls later in the year. But with inflation still sticky and still high, I can't see how the RBA can start cutting rates until probably 2024. And in fact, their forecast is they won't be hitting the top of their inflation band until 2025. And I'm also assuming my base case, no recession in Australia. I think that's looking more and more wobbly because, as I said, the data is looking more negative. And um, therefore, the worst case scenario would be that rates go higher but then they actually come down, but they've created a recession in the process. And, you know, looking at those um, uh, numbers relating to retail and uh, construction and those things, these are all negative indicators. And we'll talk about some of the assumptions that the budget made in a second because they are pretty heroic. So to my mind, my base scenario is, is, is still where I think it's likely to be. But, you know, maybe, uh, maybe the best case scenario is that the RBA doesn't lift again, but we'll see. They're going to be data-driven. Yeah, and we've got that chart now just um, showing people the percentage drawdowns we'd expect in the best and worst case scenarios. Yeah, and just to say that, you know, on a good scenario, prices will stay pretty much where they are and go up slightly. But on the worst case scenario, both units and houses would drop. And, uh, you know, remember that prices relative to income are still way off the scale. And whilst there have been some changes to lending standards and, and some underwriting to try and give people more flexibility, longer term mortgages, interest only, et cetera, et cetera. The fact is that people are spending too much of their income if they've got a mortgage on their property, particularly if you've borrowed recently. And in fact, um, now we're starting to see reports from the lenders about expecting higher levels of default later. So they're actually provisioning more and they're talking about more stressed households in their portfolios. And in fact, on the next slide, um, which really sort of highlights it, you know, the banks are now preparing for higher loan losses. And um, that was one of the five shocks that I'm seeing. Um, they are going to have to expect um, higher loan losses now because this is going to flow through. Not immediately. It will take some time. So typically people can muddle through for a few months and then maybe refinance. But eventually they get into the situation where they've got negative equity. They can't actually make their loans work and then they have to get out. And the banks are still pushing some people to try and get out sooner rather than later because they don't want the arrears. What they want is to actually get the loan replayed. So I'm afraid that we are going to see a lot of this and you know the banks are preparing for that. Yeah. And another interesting thing you spoke about there was the um, how the recession would affect those uh, the, the banks and the forecasting property downturns. And I think the latest stats say the US is, what, 80% chance. I think Australia's only seeing it, say, 40%. But we've spoken about, again, how globally everything's so interconnected. And if we are to have a recession in, in the US, it's probably going to be worse in Europe. And that flows through to Australia and even just the, the confidence and sentiment and all that stuff as well. Yeah, I, it's clear to me that the uh, chances are US will hit recession. Um, the uh, uh, Fed is still talking about lifting again. Um, some of the leading indicators was more positive. So, the, you know, the jobs number that just came out was, was quite positive. But the markets are getting really, really twitchy now. And um, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that this is going to fall over. It's going to take some time. And the question is how quick and how the Fed will react but again, Jerome Powell was talking about we have to get inflation under control. We are prepared to lift rates half we need it. And I think that all of those things lift the risk of recession. China, of course, the latest data from China was also you know, OK, but not as strong. And the, the COVID or post-COVID bounce was weaker than people expected. Uh, they're also redirecting a lot of their investment to try and get uh, Chinese people to buy stuff 
rather than actually importing stuff and then exporting it. So the whole nature of trade around China could be changing. And if you think about the US potentially catching a cold on the recession front, China easing back, those two forces could be very significant for Australia because we are connected you know, internationally. Uh, and the trade numbers could look a lot worse than they currently are. And as you will see in a second, the budget's actually benefited from much higher um, commodity prices than people expected an exchange rate move um, positively, but it's not going to happen again. So, you know, it might be just a very temporary little positive blip in the budget. Yeah, and pardon the pun there, Martin, talking about China's post-COVID recovery and the US catching a cold. But um, <laughs> there's been some interesting uh, numbers come out there in terms of, was it Yuan is now overtaking the US dollar in terms of um, Chinese-based international transactions, and we're seeing them cut deals, other nations wanting to join the BRICS nations and so on. So, you know, we always hear there's forever there's been videos going around, you know, the death of the US dollar. But I, I think it is starting to pick up that pace of the death by a thousand cuts where more and more are saying, hey, not on your terms, we're going to do things our way. Yeah, so I think that's right. The BRICS thing is very interesting. Um, of course, the holding gold is also now in vogue by um, China and Russia and a few other countries as well. Um, and uh, so the, the, the debate is to what extent will the um, US dollar remain preeminent in terms of international trade? There are alternatives. Um, not sure how it's going to play out. I think it'll probably be a bit of a slow burn. But, you know, there are more people now really questioning the long term um, trade structures and how it's going to work. And, you know, I think the BRICS thing is, is actually quite significant. And by the way, I'd say that if in fact we start seeing market falls, and that's my second shock, you know, the chances are we are going to see markets come back. At the moment, the markets are still pricing equities, particularly um, for perfection. And in fact, this chart here um, with regard to market falls shows the relative movement of US techs versus the S&P 500. It's way overstated, overpriced. And so the tech sector is still potentially due for a correction. And many other stocks are also overpriced in terms of future earnings expectations. And so if we do get a recession in the US, stock markets will come back. And, you know, some people are talking um, a significant correction. Um, they are still overvalued dramatically. And that will have a very significant effect then on the US dollar, but also on, um, you know, the international trade flows and things. So there are lots of shocks out there. Yeah, I mean, only thing I'd say is when I see this chart, I just wonder, you know, we know the large US tech stocks take up such a big chunk now of, of the market and whether or not tech mm. is just so all-powerful and all-consuming that this ratio is only going to get further and further extended compared to all these other smaller companies doing real things. And if we go into a recession, just like when we kind of went into COVID lockdowns, people that are unemployed are going to be spending more time on social media and more eyeballs and time on these apps means more <laughs> ad money for them. And again, it's this upside down world we live in where these big companies can be making money no matter what. Well, that's true. And, uh, you know, the latest uh, results from, say, um, um, Apple were actually quite, uh, quite positive and uh, there have been some big swings. What I'm interested in is the volatility. So um, whilst the volatility index has been quite low, the reason for that is that the volatility index is actually on long-term options, but everyone's now trading short-term options. And in fact, they brought out a new volatility index, which is looking at the short-term options rather than long-term ones. But the volatility in the markets benefits the major traders. So if you look at the recent financial results from a lot of the big banks, they've actually made hay because of the big movements up and down, up and down, and they can do the, um, you know, the very quick trading and all of those things. But it's not necessarily the real economy. It's not actually creating real value. And that's the worry I've got that actually, whilst you might still see, um, you know, significant movements in the markets, the risks in the markets are actually getting more significant. And as you say, the techs might, some of the techs will probably still you know, be there and, and, and be generating revenue, but a lot of them are still priced for perfection and are still assuming rates have come significant down. The future value of those tech stocks will obviously vary based on where the rates go. If interest rates can go higher, then by discounting future flows, they are less valuable today. And that's another reason why I think the, the tech sector is still the, the bellwether. Yes, okay. 
Uh, so we've probably both done plenty of videos about the banking crisis, but I did read this stat as well the other day about um, over 50% now worried about, uh, sorry, over 50% of capital concerns for these smaller US regional banks as the domino effects may start to happen. Yeah, and it's worth underscoring. This is not the same as 2007, eight, right? It, because that was a, a loan-based problem. This is about movements in interest rates, the investment strategies of the banks and frankly the exposure that they've got so a lot of the banks now have significant capital issues this isn't just one or two banks um 722 banks 722 banks in the us right mostly regional ones are potentially at risk and um you know we, we've seen um svb and we've seen other other you know um, the, the, the one last week as well we, we've we've seen some but we haven't seen the full story yet and the last one, obviously, was bailed out by a really big player. The uh, question is, can they go on doing that? If more banks fall over, will the contagion spread? And I, I've got here the, um, the index for um, regional banks, and it's just showing how much it's dropped relative to a couple of years ago. Um, there's still plenty of downside risk. Um, I don't think that this is over. I think we're just in the foothills of the, um, of the regional banking crisis in the US. And whilst it's not the same as 2008, it could have significant repercussions, not just in the US, but around the world. Yeah, I had a bit of a rant in the video I did last week about this, but how um, was it First Republic were bought out by JP Morgan and how they kind of get it at a discount, but it's backstopped. So, you know, it's all printing money and bailouts if they don't want to call it that. But at the same time, we've got Apple launching their savings accounts. So we've got biggest tech turning into our bank as well. And all this is kind of in the background of they want to roll out these central bank digital currencies and hand in hand with big tech to take control of everything. It's it's a really wild time. It is wild. And uh, yes, the interesting observation there is that central bank digital currency story is is developing quite fast. Um, you know, more and more we are seeing more and more people being pushed into the digital environment, which means that they're actually then set up for uh, when central bank digital currency comes in that means that you've got no control over your own um, destiny with regard to finance you know you can have it turned on turned off and and the fact that there's a concentration a bigger concentration of, of, of banking amongst a smaller number of very large players which is one of the um, you know the outfalls of the banking crisis at the moment well, concerns me um, you know the, I'm not sure that we need to have a great concentration we are just creating more and more difficulty later and you know the old central bank digital currency story is some um, a one to watch because to my mind it's uh, a question of not just um, finance but civil liberties as well absolutely i might comment more on that at the end as well but um we see the credit tightening again yeah now this is important because um whilst we don't see 2008 playing out directly what we are seeing is credit rationing so banks are less willing and able to lend now and so we've got um effectively um they're just tightening the loans to firms in the US, this this chart, but it's true more broadly. The cost of funds has gone up. The margin compression is there. The risk in the system are rising. And so what banks are doing is pulling back on their capacity to lend. And we've had a credit-driven economy for the last 20 years. Look at the total growth in credit, both corporate and household and government. You know, everybody's gone on the debt binge. The cost of that debt is now so high because the interest rates are higher. And that means that the world is really now beginning to, I think, get to the point of peak debt. And that means that the banks won't be able to grow their books. That means they won't be as profitable. The risks are rising. It means that some people are going to be paying a lot more, as we said, for example, mortgage stress in Australia. Um, people are having to pay a lot more. Credit timing is the thing to watch because this now has the capacity to create the next wave of uncertainty not just in the US, but I think in other places too. And then Australia, we're already seeing it. So I mentioned earlier on, you know, the borrowing power of first-time buyers dropped about 30 to 35% compared to a year ago. That's just another example of credit tightening in the practice. Yeah, certainly peak debt, as you say. Um, these credit default swaps uh, rates are spiking as people start to even worry about the US possibly defaulting on their debt. But yeah, peak debt, if rates stay this high, it's just mathematically we can't maintain these huge multi-trillion debts once rates are at 5% or above, as you say. Yeah. It's just the interest costs are, are way too high. And you mentioned the debt limit. And, you know, This is the fifth shock to talk about. The debt limit 
is 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 coming you know biden mccarthy start u.s debt ceiling talks as the clock ticks to the default now they'll probably play politics with this for some time um uh, yellen has been talking about the severe risks and it's worth just looking at you know history shows us that actually ahead of this um debt li limit ceiling markets get volatile and prices move all over the place so expect more volatility from this one as well this is going to hit significantly the next couple of months another reason why markets are being quite uh, skittish at the moment and i don't see any reason why that's going to change i don't see that they're going to resolve this right up until the deadline they probably will resolve it in some way but it will always be down to the last sort of few seconds before midnight yeah it's a bit of a party trick every few years that the debt ceiling ticks around again and they have a package and an agreement at the last minute but most countries don't have one what's the point of it if you're just going to raise it every time you get there and it's around election time it's all just a fun and games really isn't it it is but it is worth just highlighting again how much the the markets actually are impacted by this uncertainty you know and if, if the us were to default on its treasuries i mean that that, that would a be a huge deal yeah, yeah a huge deal so we'll see um, and then finally, I just quickly talk about the, the budget because it was it was pretty new. Um, interestingly, of course, they're talking about a surplus. Well, just, um, but it's it's really just temporary, right? And, and and they've made some significant concessions to help people with their power bills and to uh, help with rents and those sorts of things. Uh, as I said earlier on, the question is: Is this inflationary or deflationary? Uh, my own read is it's probably slightly inflationary, and. Um, the problem is that the power bills are going to rise a lot quicker and faster than this this is going to cover so it's going to help but not 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 really solve the problem and uh, whilst it's 15 billion or give or take it's worth thinking that through covid you know we we had 80 billion being spent so that gives you a little bit of the relative quantum but interestingly one of the questions is why have we got this um this slightly positive number in terms of the budget bottom line remember this is the annualized this isn't the total pool of debt outstanding which is still heading up probably close to a trillion. And on the next slide, it's worth just looking at that. The spikes really were actually driven by some one-off factors. So unemployment lowest in half a century, um, workers are in higher tax brackets, um, corporate tax has been a big contributor because of energy prices and because of coal and natural gas, which we of course exported. We also had the bonus of the Aussie dollar moving from a dollar ten to um, you know 70 cents, and that created a huge amount of positive um, when it was translated back into into local currencies and um the commodities of course are sold, sold in us dollars so that's positive as well but the key point to make here alex is that the in the red is where we're headed right we have a structural deficit problem which is huge and whilst um you know chalmers can claim well we, we we're going to be in you know positive land for a, a little bit it's only very very minor the fact is that looking out over the medium and long term structurally we have a real issue and in fact the this, this final slide there shows that the major economic parameters show that gdp is on the slide the unemployment rate is going to rise um the you know look at it like it or not the inflation rate is not going to be where it is and of course there's some big assumptions they've made they've made some assumptions about my level of migration um it's going to continue high they've made some assumptions about where rates are going to be all of those are pretty heroic. So um, I haven't got much um, confidence in this budget, um, as I haven't over the last few years. Uh, I feel that um, the uh, Australian economy is headed for a very, very tricky time. Yeah, I think I read the budget was aiming to reduce the projected um debt from 1.1 trillion to about 1 trillion in Australia now. So yeah, we're up towards that trillion dollar mark for a country a lot smaller. Um, than yes. many others with a similar amount of debt, but um, very interesting as you say. And you know, we even made that documentary a few years ago about how we've had all these perfect tailwinds in terms of ages and demographics and the mining boom and China helping us out and then the housing boom. So, yeah, we've had it pretty good for a very long time, but now we've got it in that a lot of debt. It kind of has to perpetually stay at those levels of growth or um, whatever. And it's just yeah, not the, mathematically. The, 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 the debt burden with the interest rates where they are and where they're going to stay, they're not going to come back down to 0.1% anytime soon unless we get a massive recession, which means that the cost of debt, the cost of service in that debt is, is going to hit us. And that's going to hit corporates, it's going to hit households, and it's going to hit the government. And so that's why we have a real structural problem. And by the way, the only real reason why, in fact, the numbers came out positive was because, of course, people are paying a lot more tax. So we're paying more income tax 
than corporate tax in Australia for the first time, as uh, uh, collectively. And um, well, how much tax should we be paying? Well, probably not as, you know, if we pay what we're paying currently and we continue to pay it, uh, we're about 45% on average. Um, there are other, like Denmark is at 55% of, 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 of um, you know, income on average, but it's still very high. And so unfortunately we see wall-to-wall -wall debt, we see significantly lifting taxes and we, we basically see a significant problem for Australia and Australians, I'm afraid, over the next little while. And the budget really hasn't solved anything. It's just provided a little bit of tactical help. Power, bill, power bills, they will continue to rise and will probably wipe out any of that support anyway. So unfortunately, it doesn't look um, particularly attractive at the moment. And of course, if international investors start getting twitchy about um, Australia, then um, Australia, which has been a proxy for investing in China indirectly for, for many international investors, that may change. And that could also put downward pressure on the economy as well. So I think buckle up is what I would say. Buckle up. Yeah, we're a fantastic test case for, for history to write about, I think, with household debt and everything that's going on. Absolutely. But, um, I'm glad to hear you've settled in and you're having fun in the UK, Martin. Thanks for joining us and um, late, at, late at night for me and early in the morning for you, but we'll make it work every month for everyone at home. So thanks as always, guys. Hope you've enjoyed the episode and we'll talk to you again soon, Martin. See ya. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.